whenever you want to start, um, hey. jump in. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm happy to start. I, um, I think it looks like the Facebook Live never got somehow connected. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have, Stacy, and your group. Yeah. So what um, I'm going to do, if it's okay with you, is I'm going to drop questions into the chat area. Yes. Um, I'm taking them directly from Facebook. Um, and if you want to kind of tackle them one at a time, and then depending right. on how much time is left at the end, um, we can maybe ask some additional questions. That's perfect. Okay, I'm. I'm. I have the chat on Zoom here because mm -hmm. unfortunately the Facebook chat is not opening. All right, let's give it a go. I am submitting now. Great. Okay. So first. Uh, the uh, item is, there seems to be some confusion surrounding the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. Could you please break it down into basic terms and advise how parents can help mitigate risk? Absolutely. So dual meaning two things. Uh, one is skin and one is gut. And so we think, and many people have done studies on this as well as ourselves, through the skin, allergies begin. Through the gut, allergies can stay quiet the diet allergies can stay quiet. So I know that seems really simplistic and a nice cute mantra. And you'd say, well, you know, is that really true? Is that the reason why everyone gets allergies? And is that the reason why everyone can perhaps decrease their allergies? It's not perfect, but I can tell you that the science is overwhelmingly strong about these two things. There's tons of research done now that shows that if the skin is dry or if there's even under the microscope, you might not be able to see it with the, your bare eye, but under the microscope, our skin is kind of has holes in it. And if there's dry skin and eczema, unfortunately our body sees anything foreign that gets through the skin as something foreign. You think of it like when mosquitoes land on our skin, when parasites and worms lie on our skin way back in evolution, the first thing our body did was secrete mucus, make it itchy, make it red, so then that way we get rid of whatever's on our skin. In the same way, when allergens get through these tiny little holes on dry skin, either babies or adults with a lot of dry skin, it actually activates the allergen pathway. We've seen this in twins, identical twins, where one has dry skin, the other one does not. We've seen it in babies that have eczema. They have much higher risk of having food allergies. So that's been proven. The other thing that's really been proven is if you have eczema and you eat the food, now let's say you don't have food allergies, but you have eczema, and that's one route by which you could activate the allergy system. But if you eat the food at the same time, your gut, your whole gut is meant to take whatever you're eating and say, okay, that's, that's food. I'm not going to react to that. I'm going to become what we call tolerant to it. So the whole machinery of the gut for which most of our immune system surrounds, it is meant to become a tolerant organism. So for a baby that has a little dry skin, and instead of having the food particles be exposed to their skin, but instead they're eating the food every day, small amounts, that actually balances out the universe and that will decrease the risk of food allergies. So that's what we mean by the dual allergen hypothesis. Sorry for the long explanation, but I hope that helps. Through the skin, allergies begin. Through the diet, allergies can stay quiet. But you wouldn't want to do this if you already have a food allergy. If you already had a food allergy, um, we can talk about that in terms of what to do. This is all about prevention of food allergy. So the next question is, I have identical twins, both with eczema and both with the exact same food allergy and reactions, exactly. So when we've done identical twin studies, and, and yay for the mom who has twins, I also have two pairs of twins, so I get it. Um, and, uh, and so there are these tendencies of genetics as well as environment that interplay. Many identical twins will have food allergies. And so there are some genetics that play a role in food allergies, but I want all parents to know that it's, you know, we put ourselves enough through guilt trips. It's not your fault. It's sometimes genes play a role, but most of the time they don't. About two thirds of the time they don't. 
So identical twins we've been studying for a while, if they both had eczema and they both have the same exact food allergy, that does make a lot of sense. And that, that explains things. If they both had eczema, then they probably both had a route by which they got food allergies. Um, and the next question is how much and how often should a food be eaten to help prevent an allergy? Say a tree nut to which a kid tests positive to but has passed a food challenge? Okay, great question. Or for the leaf babies as they grow up having successfully avoided the peanut allergy so far. So I, I think everyone knows what the leaf study is. That's where in Israel, they noticed that they had much less peanut allergies overall compared to uh, children in the United Kingdom, for example. And so they realized that maybe they were getting less peanut allergy because they were eating bamba as teething, um, Puffs. And so lo and behold, even though we as parents were being told back in the 2000s to avoid the introduction of egg and avoid the introduction of milk and peanut and shrimp for our babies, instead, the whole field has turned 180. And instead, they say, don't avoid the food. As long as that baby doesn't have a known food allergy, start feeding early and often at around four to six months of age. It doesn't have to, you don't have to exclude breastfeeding. Keep Keep breastfeeding, keep doing formula if you have to. It's, that's obviously many choices that go on in that. We talk about that in the book. But in addition, start to feed early and often. And to answer your question, um, Stacy, what we've noticed is that you just need a little bit of protein. And we like to suggest, because we have data at Stanford to say, if you have a protein that includes all of the food proteins, all in once. When you give that simultaneously to the gut, when you give that to a little baby, that baby's immune system gets even stronger and completely becomes anti-allergic when you do it all at once. And there's certain reasons for that um, in terms of the cells. And we've done a lot of work on that research and we've, um, uh, I'm happy to talk to people more about that if they're interested. But it does not have to be a lot of food, but what it does have to be is every day uh, or every other day. It can't be every week. So if you just kind of haphazardly feed the food now, it doesn't really create that beautiful tolerance that you want to be able to prevent the food allergy for. So we've learned a lot and you'd say, well, why, why do you have to do it every day? Like when I was growing up, I didn't, my my mother didn't have to feed me all these foods every day to make sure they were in my diet. Well, the world is a different place now. Unfortunately, we think that because of the environmental exposures and we're learning more about the detergents that are being used, there's a lot different ways that foods are processed. The gut microbiome probably plays a role. So with all of that in hand, we have to actively prevent a disease because food allergy, especially for some tree nuts, for example, is doubling every 10 years. So there are things in the environment that are affecting us. And there are ways now in the book that we give you tools by which to prevent the worsening of allergies or preventing food allergies altogether. Um, the, Next question is, how do you sensitize a 10-year-old with multiple food allergies, egg, dairy, peanuts, and tree nuts? Great question. So someone asked me the same question back in 2009, and I really felt for the mom. Her name was Kim Grosso, and she was, uh, and her daughter, Tessa Grosso, was one of the heroes that they talked about in the New York Times article in 2013 on our, our initial work, and that had been done um, almost seven years ago, but now we have three thousand people that we've treated at Stanford with this regimen. And now the NIH and the FDA is moving forward with looking at a clinical trial to be approved for multiple food allergies. And so when the mom in 2009 came to me and Kim asked, hey, my daughter doesn't just have peanut allergies. And literally, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion on peanut allergies around in the community. I understand that. But people are allergic to more than peanuts. And we know that as parents, I think you probably all know that. And people are allergic to multiple food allergies. And because of that, we need to think about simultaneously getting these desensitized at once. And we talk about that in the book, that that 
now is in your hands. It's possible to be done. There are clinics now doing that. You need to work with very trained personnel. You don't want to do this at home. But to the body, these are all proteins. And so if you do it safely and carefully and under the supervision of a very well-trained clinic and well-trained individuals, you can get there. So it's absolutely possible to desensitize a 10-year-old. And my oldest patient has been 99. So the amazing thing is that the immune system can become strong and become desensitized to these foods. And you can do it all at once. Um, the next question is, what does the current evidence say about the ideal OIT peanut maintenance dose for toddlers? How does it differ from leave guidelines for early introduction? So the LEAP study is for prevention. And we talk about that in the book, about what's the tools by which you can prevent uh, food allergy. But then if your child already has a known food allergy, and we also talk about in the book, what the, how is that different from a food sensitivity? How do you want to make sure that you know if you have a food allergy or not? And I, I can get into that if there's a question about that later. But let's say your toddler already has a known food allergy to milk or to peanut. We're still learning what the best maintenance dose is. Thankfully, this past year, Palforzi was approved as a drug for peanut allergy. It was approved not in toddlers, but a specific age group in, in children older than toddlerhood. I think they will try to move back the clock and see about getting it approved in younger age groups. But most importantly, you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, oral immunotherapy, do it in a very safe place that's FDA approved drug, hopefully, and that again, there are, there's a board certified allergist that is part of the clinic and that you can work with if you do have a toddler. What the best maintenance dose is, what I find is that each person's a little bit different. 300 milligrams is about a peanut's worth of protein. The maintenance dose for peanut might be different from the maintenance dose for milk, for example. And what I'd like to do as a clinician is to wait until the skin test becomes negative in that individual. Then I know that that maintenance dose is really working because a skin prick test that's negative is really negative. The, what we say predictive value of a negative skin prick test is great. The predictive value of a positive skin test is not so great. But when it goes negative, then you know your maintenance dose is probably real. I hope that helps. Um, so the next question is, um, how do you recommend we find a well-trained OIT clinic? Great. I actually go through that in the book. I, I give you as parents, and if you are, again, OIT is for all ages. You can actually and should think about, especially as an adult. I know that adults with food allergies can be very disabling and people think, okay, I've avoided this all my life, why not now? It's just the fact that many adults are learning for the first time that they get food allergies in adulthood. So we need to make sure that whatever we're calling the end of food allergy, we do it for all age groups and have that accessible for everyone. So choosing the right clinic is key. You wanna make sure that um, the people there have had experience in food allergy immunotherapy, that you ask them about their all-inclusive type clinic. There's a great clinic that uh, we uh, were able to start. I was telling you about Kim Grosso, and she's fantastic. And she started a clinic called Latitude. And it is a what I would say a great example of a clinic that you can go to, and it's a it takes care of the whole person, right? Because I know a lot of you, and I as well, empathize with the fact that this is a disabling disease. It's very anxiety provoking. And you want to make sure that if you're going to talk to a clinic, that it's a team approach and that you have a board certified allergist that discusses things with you, as well as other clinicians that really know um, the process of immunotherapy and that you get a catered personalized type uh, introduction. Ideally, eventually, would, it would be the case that these clinics will be using FDA approved drugs for all that involves food allergy therapy. And I think that's coming, and we talk about that in the book, that there are many companies in the food allergy space now, Palforzia and Aimmune brought the first FDA-approved drug to the table, but I know the FDA is very excited about 
approving other items like um, multiple food therapies, and that's also now moving forward with another company called Aladapt. So I'm excited that you should all know that there's a lot of hope and promise of science now. And we do give you kind of a, a sheet of questions to ask if you're thinking about oral immunotherapy. It's not easy. There are safety issues that you need to think about. It's a team approach, but please know that it's possible but you've got to do it with the right team. And so we do talk about in the book, what are some of those criteria to use? Again, these are suggestions. I'm not your own, I'm not your doctor, but these are suggestions on a whole as an expert. And Sloan Barnett, who's a parent, also wrote this with me. So she really talks a lot of, from a patient's perspective too, and a parent's perspective. Okay, um, the next question is, is there a current way to discern uh, outgrown versus desensitized within the context of IT? Excellent question. So, and, and I don't mean this to be all about Stanford, but there are many people in the book that we um, acknowledge and talk about their wonderful research because a lot of the therapy now available in food allergies because there's been incredible work done around the globe for many different clinical trials. One of the things that's very hard to find though are people that naturally lose their allergies that you can actually get blood and get biomarkers at the very beginning of their illness and follow them over time and see with and without OIT, what does the immune system look like for someone that naturally loses their allergies versus, versus um, loses their allergies by OIT. And so we finally were able to get those cohorts at Stanford, it took a long time. And what's clear is that OIT gives you the same benefit as naturally losing your allergies. So that's great. But for both scenarios, you need to keep eating the food here and there to make sure that you stay desensitized, to make sure that you stay naturally lost of that allergy. And many people don't know that. They think that if you've naturally lost your food allergies, which again is less frequent than even 10 years ago, that um that if you lose it okay great you've lost it now you don't have to worry anymore in fact you still should probably eat that food um and what we recommend is eating it at least every three days to make sure that it's in your diet um to have your immune system stay strong so that you don't have that food come back and that's the case whether or not you've done oral immunotherapy or whether or not you've lost your food allergy um the next Oh, I, uh, sorry, let me, um, I want to make sure I do this in sequence. So the next question, I see they're, they're really coming. Um, so the next question is, my 15-year-old has milk and egg allergies. How does one know if he should do Zoller with or without OIT? Great. Who is a strong candidate for Zoller? Does one wean off Zoller after treatment? Do they maintain their non-allergic status for years even though? Okay. So let me just uh, back up a little bit. Zoller is uh, this great biological molecule that inhibits IgE to some extent. IgE is the match that lights the fire behind food allergies, as well as other things like asthma. We originally used it in one of our clinical trials at Stanford. And what I, what I believe anti-IgE allows you to do is be able to go through immunotherapy safer uh, because you have less reactions. So that's the first thing. It also allows you to hasten the timelines, depending. And so depending on the clinic and how things are being used, where it might have taken two years to get up to a maintenance dose, the Zoller allows you to do it faster. But I want to put a little caveat there that Zoller is great for the majority of people that use it. The majority of people say they get a benefit, but some say, it didn't work for me that great. And we're trying to still understand why that is. Um, as, as all of you know, no one drug is a panacea, but when you're taking immunotherapy and you're trying to make it safer or you're trying to make it less anxiety provoking for your child, the fact that you can try to give it with Zoller, I believe is very helpful. Now, there are issues in terms of the fact that Zoller is still not approved for food allergies, so you need to talk to the clinic about trying to make sure that it's available to be used in conjunction with immunotherapy. But hope is on the way. It's hope will be hopefully um, uh, realized. 
because luckily Genentech Novartis and the NIH for the COFAR group now has a breakthrough designation phase three trial that's currently in process of enrolling patients in clinical trials. Um, and that is fantastic because hopefully Zola will be approved for food allergies soon. So fingers crossed, but it's an excellent question. Um, so again, trying to get to that FDA approval process takes time. We shouldn't just stop at Palforzia as a peanut immunotherapy drug. It's fantastic that we have that now in our pockets, but we need to go beyond that. And the only way to go beyond that is to do clinical studies. Now, most clinical studies don't include a placebo arm. So I hope all of you will really consider being in clinical studies if you're eligible and being part of that process. There are heroes and pioneers that are part of that process. And I really admire the moms and dads and patients that are in there. So I wouldn't be able to tell you any of the data that I'm talking to you about today without clinical trials. And I'm very grateful for that and, and for sponsorship therein. The next question is, if a baby does have a reaction to one food, but not anaphylaxis and does test positive with IgE, is there any method route to keep the food in the diet before the baby becomes a year old? Yes, I believe some babies in leaf study did test positive exactly, and, and, but they still ate peanut, that's correct. Is there a certain Ig level that would indicate still attempting to feed a small amount of for the food? Yes, is OIG the best route? Okay, great question. So we talk about in the book, the fact that there's this fine line between knowing if your baby has, and we're talking about babies here because that's the question. Before the age of two years old, when babies have a true food allergic reaction, now uh, I used to think that when my baby ate cinnamon, she would have this rash around her mouth or pineapple. And I learned then after I was in fellowship that that's just because of the acid part of the food. It has nothing to do with an actual IgE mediated allergy. So the first thing to do is, does your baby really have an allergy? And if the positive IgE, if you've gone a blood test and the skin test is positive and the IgE is really positive and there are published thresholds by which you can actually find out if that, if that threshold is met for specific IgE for that food, you know that you have a very high chance of having a real food allergy. And that's where your board certified allergist should be able to help you with that because that's what we learn. That's what we're trained to do. That's what we get tested on in our boards is to know what those thresholds are. And I give references and resources in the book about that. Um, so there's a fine line though, if they're below that threshold, then yes, I will say, well, you know, here we are, your baby might have eczema. They have a high risk of getting food allergy. They might get worse. And so why not start with very small amounts and we can think about preventing other food allergies because the chance, if your baby has one food allergy, the chances of having another food allergy are basically 45 to 50%. So you also want to prevent the progress of other food allergies too. So it's as if, if this is possible for any age group, we're talking a lot about babies and infants today, but I also want to let you know, this is possible for all age groups, that the ability to tolerize is there, but you need to be super careful. And the best thing to do is to do all this and through a clinical study. If you don't have a, uh, anywhere near you, please let me know. And I'm happy to answer other questions about this, but this is a very important question. And we don't know all the answers yet, but I hope that some of my answers have helped discern the difference between real food allergy and how a baby might become sensitized and how to try to prevent that from happening in the future. But it's really best to talk to your doctor about that. Um, I'm gonna continue to go down these so that I know many of you are on the East Coast, so it's, it might be getting late. If one undergoes OIT too young, do they risk taking a dose for life when they might have otherwise outgrown it? Great question. So that is at the centerpiece of a lot of our questions at, in the NIH and uh, other experts in the field. There's been a lot of studies on this. So because of this, what I was talking about, there being some thresholds, there's actually something called um, nomograms that you can look up and you can find out what your chances are of having food allergy for the rest of your life and not outgrowing it. 
And now a days, it's less and less likely that you're going to grow out of your milk and egg allergy, for example. It was thought, for example, about 20 years ago, that if you got milk and egg allergy when you were an infant, you had an 80% chance of growing out of it. And that's not the case anymore. So again, our environment is at works here. But importantly, is if you are going to undergo OIT, it's your personal choice. There are different clinical trials and different clinics that will try to help different age groups. But because there are other elements about trying to feed the very same thing that you've told your 19 year old could hurt them, it's harder for, I find at least, it's harder for some adolescents to wrap their minds around that. And in general, it's easier for children that are younger when the parent has a little bit more oversight to be able to start immunotherapy younger. And yes, whoever answered, uh, uh, Kylan is correct that we don't necessarily say that when you're done with immunotherapy, you should stop taking the immunotherapy for the rest of your life. And, um, but I can tell you that if you work with the right clinic, with the board certified physician, who's an allergist, as well as enter into a clinical trial, then you'll know that you we're not going to outgrow it. People would not hopefully be offering you this if you were in that threshold where you could outgrow it. The next question from um, another person is, how would you recommend to incorporate foods to give regularly to someone with over 20 multiple, yes, allergies to maintain these foods in their diet realistically? So. Um, so first, if you have over 20 multiple food allergies and you've had food challenges to each one of them to show that you have a doctor's diagnosis of food allergy, then absolutely, there are clinical trials now to be able to help with multiple food allergies. And then it is possible to simultaneously be able to try to help you. Now, there are, if, it, if you're allergic to 20, um, you've got to make sure that you don't have a dosing issue and that it's gonna be hard to make sure that all of those are in small amounts as you dose up over time. But to the body, whether that's one or 20, it's all proteins to the body, it's all proteins to your immune system. So it is realistically possible. But now the question I think you're asking is, once you're done with your immune therapy, how are you possibly gonna make sure you get all of those things in at once? There are food products out there now. Um, we have made one through Stanford called Spoonful One that has 16 of the food proteins that are commonly associated with food allergies in it at, um, at low doses. So that at least gets you to 16. And then there are other food items that if you talk to your doctor, you could think about how to incorporate them in a daily or every other day level to just keep things going. And then again, once that skin test goes negative, then you can think about sparsing it out. But there are food products out there. Now, I understand some people are kosher, some people are vegan. So you need to think creatively about these multiple um, food type mixes, but we're excited that there are some available and we wouldn't suggest that they be used for immunotherapy right now. But most importantly, I'm just talking about foods. The next question is incorporating foods that induce eczema flares would seem to increase susceptibility. Ah, great question. So in fact, like I was saying with the stool allergen hypothesis, you're absolutely right. It was thought initially that if you feed the foods that could make your eczema redder and itchier, that you should just stop those foods and withdraw them. But what Dr. Lack, Dr. Gideon Lack and many other people have shown now is actually as long as your baby doesn't have a defined food allergy by a doctor, you should keep feeding that baby and you'll see that the eczema starts receding, it starts going away, and that's helpful. So we have actually found, as well as in the LEAP study, that the eczema initially was exacerbated for like the first three days, and then as you continue to feed the baby in the LEAP study, for example, the peanut, um, the eczema started to decrease. So I hope that helps um, in this. So the 20 multiple allergens, it's all protein to the body. It is possible to do that. Happy to discuss if you wanna email me directly um, in my Stanford email, happy to talk more about that.
The next question is, can you speak to the dual exposure theory and how important skin exposure versus exposure really, okay, um, causes the skin rash from abscess. Is it important to quickly expose via ingestion or is it okay to wait and naturally expose via the food without urgency? And can you speak to the advancements in sesame food labeling? Okay, so that's, there's a lot of questions there, but let me uh, attempt to ask the, answer the first one. So it's important to expose the gut, we think, daily, even to small serving sizes to be able to prevent food allergy. And this should be done regularly, it should not be done every week. The body has this amazing immune system and that when you do something every day, it starts to get used to that. There's something about our daily diets, our daily rhythm that's really important for our immune system. And so with that, it should be carefully done with the fact that through the skin, allergies begin, through the diet, allergies can stay quiet. Then I would say even if a child has skin reactions and eczema, as long as they don't have a defined food allergy already, start to feed those foods through the diet to help them. And that naturally exposes them. But in terms of urgency, I would say that the LEAP data, this other study that was published in the New England Journal called the EAT study, it shows that you really ought to start at around four to six months of age. Other studies that came out of Israel and Japan, even some of them imply that you should start even earlier. But we want to make sure that we stay within WHO guidelines. And right now we're suggesting four to six months of age. And that seems to be a sweet spot in which you can really help the gut get trained. And that makes sense. I mean, babies are learning so much um, from uh, the day they're born. Uh, and the first three years of life is amazing. Uh, but we do know the immune system is also developing during that time. And we believe that it really helps to give some of these preventative strategies early. And there is a sense of urgency in that regard. And I would, say that there's a sense of urgency. However, what we have also shown is, let's say you're nine years old and you wanna be able to uh, prevent yourself from getting food allergy in the future, or you're 19, or you're 39, or you're 99, um, you can start feeding uh, through the diet those types of foods and try to reduce your likelihood of getting food allergy. So this system works at any age, but we think that there's a sweet spot in the early age group that it's really um, helpful to work in. Sesame labeling. I know that that is also uh, a, um, a question that many parents ask me. There's a portion of the book that we talk about this. We talk about how instrumental labeling laws were that the FDA al allowed to move forward. We're so happy that the FDA has been working so creatively and innovatively with us with these things. However, it takes a small group of people, I believe, to change the world. And so as, as advocates, we need to keep going on the hill and making sure that we feel comfortable with the labeling laws that exist right now. There's a lot of different ways that those labels exist. We talk about that in the book um, to try to clarify. And I think all of us can be advocates for our families, for our people with food allergies. But in addition, we need to be advocates for health policy changes on better labeling. Uh, laws, not just for labeling food items, but also for uh, restaurants and other places to be able to make sure that people with food allergy can live a safer life. And um, I really feel strongly about that. I want to make sure that I can be helpful as a voice to help. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that people here, hopefully on this um, call today, we can join outside of this particular Zoom call or Facebook Live call and, and try to think about some of these questions that still remain for us to do in food allergy. Is Sesame um, successful in OIT? Yes, I've, um, and we as a team, Stanford has a great team of individuals and I'm sure there are other people with experience in desensitized to Sesame, but again, it's a protein. Food allergies are to proteins. And so in, you can desensitize to a protein and it works. And so as long as you have small amounts of sesame flour that you can give over time and you know that it's sesame and you, the clinic that you're working with, make sure that they tell you the dose each time and is very transparent about that. Any food you can use as a protein to desensitize for that food allergen.
The next question is, um, if a child keeps developing new allergies to foods that they previously consumed and tested negative to, is there something that can be done to boost their immune system or body overall? Yeah, we talk about this in the book. Overall, we talk about these five Ds. And I understand there's this, what we call March. If you develop uh, an allergy to one food, like I said, you've got about a 45 to 50% chance of developing a food allergy to, to another food at some point in your life. And if you have a food allergy, you have a, about a 25% chance of having an anaphylactic reaction at some point in your life. And Ruchi Gupta, my colleague, um, with her, uh, her teammate, Chris Warren, and who is, they did an amazing study, and they really did find that um, it's very important to be able to think about who has food allergies, how often are they diagnosed early, and how can we prevent this march from happening so that they don't get other allergies. And so talk to your physician, but I would say start early thinking about immunotherapy. If there's a clinical trial nearby, please do that. Um, there are other ways to boost the immune system, and there are ways to decrease the function of the immune system. So let's talk about that. So if you have good vitamin D levels, if you have a great diet, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, have good fiber in your diet, make sure your vitamin levels are all good. And this is for all ages, not just babies or infants as well as having good microbiota. So we know that fermented foods are helpful. I know that if someone has a milk allergy, that's hard to have yogurt, right? So, but please think about having some good microbiota in the gut. Um, I used to think the desiccated pills were good for microbiota. It's since been proven that's not correct. You need to have live cultures that are available now. Um, and we do talk about some of those resources in the book as to which companies um, have some very good overall microbiota. It's still not clear exactly which microbiota are helpful, but we know the microbiota in general line the gut with a beautiful lining so that you have less what we call gut leakiness. So to answer your question, yes, there's good ways to help the immune system stay strong, eat a healthy diet, have exercise, sleep when you can. I know that's easy to say, not so easy to do when you're a parent and, um, or an adult, but that's really important to get good sleep. The things to avoid are detergents. If you are gonna use detergents, use those detergents that are healthy for the planet because what's not healthy for the planet is not healthy for your skin and not healthy for your gut. When you look at the dishwasher and the typical dishwasher detergents that we use, if you actually scrape your finger on that plate after the dish is done, even though it's squeaky clean to us or it's beautiful in terms of white and shiny, unfortunately, there's still detergent typically left on the food plate. And so when we eat the food, that detergent's getting inside our gut. And that, be, that might be one of the many reasons why we're getting more food allergies these days, especially also detergents that are laying on the baby's skin after washing clothes. So we think there's a lot of different reasons why we are seeing an increase in food allergies. And I'm just giving you some examples of things that you might be able to control to decrease the risk. Tobacco smoke, vaping, pollution, certain antacid use uh, will increase the risk of food allergies. And so we talk about that in the book in terms of what to do to decrease your risk of food allergies. And then finally, having a dog at home in the first year of life, if, as long as you don't have dog allergies, also really helps to reduce uh, the risk of food allergies in your child. So all of this is saying there's an important environmental aspect. And we try to, in the book, answer questions for that we know, for that we have strong data I don't have all the answers. And all of this is to say that it decreases the risk, but I certainly don't want to have you go through any guilt trip saying, oh my gosh, I should have done that. I should have gotten a dog in the first year of my child's life. Like it's not to say that even if you do have a dog in the first year of life, your child still might've gotten food allergies. But we do know that it's nothing to do with breastfeeding or while you're pregnant, what you ate. A lot of parents think that there's relationships between what they eat during pregnancy and what their child got is food allergy, but there's actually no connection. So that's important to know. Why does not including a food sometimes lead to more severe allergies if consumed later on again? Why does not including a food sometimes lead to, uh, I see, and other, and other times lead to disappearance of that allergy? Yeah, so what we now know to be true in the large, so initially, 
when a well meaning group of people came together in the 2000s, they were working on a very small data set where they thought that by avoiding the foods that you would allow that allergy to disappear. And I myself was trained that way and I used to tell my patients that. But now there is so much data, thousands of patients worth of data now to say that's actually, that was just kind of associated but not necessarily uh, a cause and effect relationship. And in fact, it's much better to eat the foods often and to take those and that will definitely, and to eat them regularly to avoid allergies in the future. So I hope that helps you. Um, and by not including the food in the diet, typically, why does it lead to severe allergies? Because your immune system isn't seeing it typically. And why do we have the top nine, right? Why is it why is it tree nuts and peanut and soy and milk and wheat? Why, why not coffee? Why not some proteins that are, you know, seeds and beans that typically we take every day? We don't know, we don't know the answers to that yet, but we do know for those proteins that are in the top 10, and now that top 10 is increasing, you know, add sesame, add other things now, that list is continuing to grow now globally as we look at food allergy risk around the globe. So eating those foods, we think, and we have data now, as well as many people around the country and the globe have data that eating those regularly is, is helpful to decrease the risk of a severe reaction. Do you think there will eventually be a vaccine approved to cure food allergies? I sure hope so. There are three companies that are now doing vaccines. We talk about that in the book. They're in phase two trials right now, and I'm really excited. I think the people that are lining up to be in those clinical trials, you know, my hat's off to you because it's so exciting to be in that new era of research as a pioneer. And so there are people that are now in those clinical trials. And so far, the fact that it's going from phase one to phase two, you kind of know that it's been shown to be safe, at least in that group that was initially tested. And now there's a vaccine that's even being used in teenagers. So that's a good sign too. But it's one food at a time. Uh, the vaccine will probably just be one food, peanut, and then milk, and then, um, and then wheat, hopefully. But I do think that that's an exciting part of the future, although I, I also think that we need to be careful. The one, the one regimen that we know works and works well if you do it and you don't have reactions that preclude you from being in the study is oral immunotherapy. So that's exciting to know that's in your in your chest of things to do. Um, so uh, the next question is, you mentioned detergents and environmental factors. Have any specific chemicals or terms have been identified? Yes, would love to remove those for things from the household. Yes, so a, spe a specific detergent called triclosan has been shown very specifically to be associated with uh, allergies and food allergies. So um, all detergents are, I'm not saying are bad. There are certain detergents that include what we call proteases that digest things. And if they, if they digest proteins, they actually digest your skin because your skin is made of cells that have proteins. And so if you look on the label, look at, um, not that everyone should have to look at the labels of the detergents now, but just know that if you buy a detergent that's safe for the planet, typically it doesn't have those bad chemicals in it, like triclosan and like the proteases. All right, next question is, in your opinion, what are the next best options for patients who didn't succeed with OIT? What do you think is happening in the immune system if those patients who experience such difficulties? Yeah, great question. So I think there are people, we, when at Stanford, for example, we test 72 different parts of the immune system. We just don't test IgE because we know it's more than that. Food allergies are highly complex. And you know, what happens when you get a treatment, and that's fantastic, people become lumped into one category. Okay, that person is peanut allergy, but let's face it, there are so many different types of people with peanut allergy. There's those that have peanut allergy plus asthma, those that have peanut allergy plus eczema, those that have peanut allergy plus other treated allergies, those that have peanut allergy plus soy allergies. So to me, we should be catering to the fact that each person is very different and that we should be recommending regimens that work for these different types of people. So the fact that 
when someone takes immunotherapy and about 20 to 30 percent will have reactions during immunotherapy whether or not there be mild or abdominal pain i feel like we should do better we should make sure that we have an immunotherapy regimen that no one has a reaction to how hard is it to see that in your child to go through uh oral immunotherapy and have those reactions although it's definitely important to go through because on the other side they're desensitized so it takes again a special clinic to make sure that they work with you to get to the other side it's possible but there are people that because of abdominal pain because of other issues they will stop that does not preclude you from being in uh, and doing another therapy sometime in the future um, you have to check in with clinical trials on that but what I'd like to say is that what we've seen, at least in the people that we've looked at, no one is refractory to immunotherapy. Everyone has the tool set in their immune system to become desensitized. But it's just that some people have parts of their immune system that are more prone to having side effects. And when you have those side effects, they can cause you to stop the clinical trial. But if you were allowed to continue, if those side effects were mitigated, you could and you have a full tool set in your body, everyone is born with it, to be able to get desensitized. So I hope that helps you. Um, the next question is, we were considering putting our eight-year-old with peanut tree and allergy on Zeller, but became concerned about side effects. What's your opinion? Um, I, I also, when I first started using Zoller, I called the FDA, I asked tons of questions because I wouldn't want to use anything that I wouldn't want to use in my own children um, and suggest that to children in a clinical trial. And there's enough safety data now with Zoller that it's pretty clear that you can even use it in six months and above. So I can let you know that the safety data is phenomenal of any biologic. It's very specific. And the only thing we do know is that sometimes it increases your chance of getting a parasite infection. Uh, and there are some reactions that might have happened on the skin, but for most people, it's very safe. And that's why I think the FDA has allowed it in clinical trials to, a, to be given in even young babies. Yeah, I hope that helps you. All right. Um, so for um, the next question is, in reference to the dual allergen theory, how does skin testing not contribute to the introduction of allergen through the skin? Great question. So that was a concern of a lot of people. Was doing a skin test alone increasing your chance? And the through the skin allergies begin hypothesis and what's known now is that that allergen exposure has to be like frequent. So it's typically what's in the dust of your house. That's been proven by many people the, you'd think that there isn't a lot of food in the dust around your house, but actually there is. And even small amounts getting into that baby skin with eczema every day, getting onto that adult skin with eczema every day, it takes its toll. But skin testing, which is very random, maybe you do it every nine months or every three months if you're in a clinical trial, that has not been shown to induce food allergies at all. So that's great. That's been studied a lot because people were very worried about that. So we at least know that, and we have very good data to say that that's not the case. Um, and the next question is, any strategies for how to introduce additional allergens for babies who are already allergic to multiple foods? Let them eat the potential allergen freely. Ah. So be very careful if your doctor, if you've been through a board certified allergist and they have said that your baby has X, Y, or Z food allergy, do not feed them X, Y, or Z food for sure. And if you do only do it as part of an immunotherapy program, that's either a clinical trial or in an FDA approved drug through a clinic or with a clinic that really knows um, what they're doing for immunotherapy. But please know that you should not be doing this at home if your baby or anyone, any age, has already been diagnosed by a board certified allergist. You cannot just trust uh, skin tests alone or blood tests alone. It has to be a board certified allergist telling you whether or not you have a food allergy. Um, what are your recommendations for decreasing IT deaths over time? Uh, yeah, 
And then can all patients expect to eventually move to a non-daily dosing schedule? This is, a, this is also a tough question. We talk about this in the book. I don't have all the answers. I wish I did. We're only as good as our data, and that means we're only as good as our clinical trials. We did set up some clinical trials where we decreased OIT doses over time, and we went from four grams maintenance of peanut, for example, and we dropped it down to 300 milligrams. On the whole, by taking 300 milligrams every day or every other day as maintenance, it allowed you to go up to about 1,000 milligrams without having a reaction. So I think to the person that wants to at least not have to worry about accidental ingestion when they do food immunotherapy, that, that's good data to have. But not a lot of clinical trials actually have a randomized controlled arm where they're purposely decreasing doses. I'm only, about, I'm only aware of ours and maybe a few others. So it's a great question, but we don't have definitive answers yet. And again, each person's a little different. So you gotta work with your clinic on that and see what dose works. But I'd much rather, let's say you have an individual and I have some adults that just say, I cannot do this anymore. I'm not eating a Reese's peanut butter cup of peanuts every, every day, I can't. And so I'll say, okay, well, what can you at least tolerate? Let's at least negotiate something so that you don't lose what you just gained with your desensitization. So a lot of this is um, talking to patients about what they can tolerate so they don't, at least take something so you don't lose that level of protection. Are there any Sesame clinical trials for a 10-month-old in New York, Long Island, New York City? I'm not aware of any, but you, know, you can go on clinicaltrials.gov and we give that resource in the book. Um, and you should look at the COFAR website too to, to look at any clinical um, trials. And I'm excited that I think you also, all of you have a voice that if you want a clinical trial, there always should be community-based participation in any of these clinical studies, as well as in clinics that are going on around the country that you as individuals can ask for things. And by doing that, then, Hopefully you'll find an advocate or a researcher that will start doing sesame immunotherapy, for example. We did that at Stanford because we had a lot of patients that were allergic to it, so we started to incorporate that. But again, that came through community-based inspiration from patients, and that's what we need more of, I believe. Uh, next question is, if a child, a two-year-old, has multiple diagnosed food allergies due to blood or skin testing IG over 100, does it make sense to start Slitter-LAT without the challenge first the challenge to your skin? Ah, I see. Um, we, you know, I, I have had some patients with over 100, and when you do the food challenge, it's completely negative, like shrimp and some peanut, and I'm always surprised. So there's a reason why the food challenge is still the gold standard. However, if you have a clinical history where eating that has caused a reaction and your Ig is over 100, you know pretty much that you're going to have a reaction. I have been fighting very hard to try to think about how you can replace the food challenge. It's, it's scary, it's not fun. What should we do as clinicians to make sure that it does not become the gold standard? There's gotta be something better. And so we talk about those alternatives in the book. We're still not there yet perfectly, but there's a lot of knowledge already out there in the literature, and I do cite a lot of this in the book, that probably about 50% of the food challenges are not needed. And I'll be very frank, because my colleagues in Boston, at Children's Boston, have, have really published this very well. And they showed that probably if you just looked at the skin prick test and the IgE testing, you wouldn't need to the food challenge. You know that that person's gonna have a reaction. So for clinical trials, that's different. You really need like gold standard, and the FDA will require that if a drug gets approved that we do food challenges. But I do think we need to take a better look at the things that we already have in hand. We're already wearing the ruby slippers for a lot of our patients so that we don't have to do the food challenge. And the next question is, and by wearing the ruby slippers, I mean we already have the knowledge in hand based on skin prick testing and IgE testing that you likely probably don't need a food challenge to prove that you have food allergies. So again, that there's a great article published by my colleagues, Linda Schneider, um, uh, showing what those thresholds are. In your experience, does puberty interact with or affect food allergies? Yes. So people have done this work. My colleague, Wes Berks, and um, and uh, my colleague, uh, 
Stacy Jones in Arkansas, they were the first to tell me when I started to do this work. And really, they were my mentors in Hugh Sampson and, and Bob Wood and Dale Ometsu. They all said, be careful that when someone goes through puberty, as your hormones change, it can affect your threshold for reactivity. So if someone is in that and you do see that they're starting to have more reactions, and if you're doing immunotherapy, of course, decrease the dose. But puberty does change the immune system, and it's important to know that. It can change asthma as well. So talk to your doctor about that. Um, and so, and then also thyroid disease. If you have hypothyroidism, it can also increase your chances of um, having reactions in the skin. How does one distinguish between oral allergy syndrome and regular food allergy? This is very important. We talk about that in the book. Oral allergy syndrome, um, you have allergies to a protein. Again, all proteins, except for this one alpha gal allergy that's related to a tick bite. And, Beef, but that's uh, very rare. It's in, the, it's in the southeast mostly. But when you distinguish between oral allergy syndrome, it's to a protein, to a pollen that can also be in foods like cherries and peaches and certain fruits. And that's to be taken seriously because if you bite into an apple and you go for a jog or if you go to a jacuzzi, it can actually rev up your blood so that if you were going to have a reaction, you could actually have anaphylaxis with oral allergy syndrome. It's less likely because when you cook that food, like apples or cherries or peaches, that, that protein, what we call, becomes denatured and then it goes away. But that's not the case for peanut. That's not the case for a lot of milk allergies or egg allergies or treated allergies. So regular food allergy is, when I used to talk about food allergy, oral allergy syndrome is a part of food allergy. I don't think them to be that different. I just think about them to be a different set of proteins, that's all. But just like you can desensitize to food allergens, you can also desensitize to those proteins that are food allergens that cause oral allergy syndrome. Um, and does OIT change the microbiome? Yes, we just published a study um, for the first time uh, that we showed, and thankfully there were wonderful patients that gave us samples over the course of their immunotherapy and compared to placebo or people that were peanut allergic but did not receive therapy, we showed that the OIT actually was able to change the microbiome for a good, good microbiome. So that was really cool to see. And the gut became less leaky. We also did other studies to look at gut leakiness. Um, and that's great. We're excited to, if people are interested, I'm happy to share that paper. We are doing further research um, in microbiome, but there's a company called Vedanta in Boston and Cambridge that's actually running a clinical trial where they're studying whether or not that microbiome can uh, reduce the threshold um, or the risk of reacting to peanut allergy. I think that's going on at the Mass General right now, Mass General Hospital in Boston. If my daughter is allergic to concentrated sesame, we are waiting to test stray sesame seeds. Can we start low doses of low sesame? Um, yeah, you know, I don't want to promote any one product over another, but absolutely. So Spoonful One does have sesame in it, and it one puff, for example, has one milligram of sesame. So I would start really low and slow. No one has had a bad reaction that um, that we have at least found. should talk to your food, uh, you should talk to your allergist um, about any specific items for your daughter because I don't know them um, specifically. Are there any, is there any success with EOE and multiple? Yes, so we actually ran what we call an expanded access study with patients with EOE and food allergies because a lot of my patients had both. And so yes, it is possible. I do believe with the advent of Dupilnav, because it's been shown to be effective in EOE and hopefully food allergies as well, that that's a drug that can be used to help people with EOE and food allergies. I hear we can be tricky with OIT. Is that true? Everything is tricky in OIT to me um, because it, it, all patients in all humility, each of them deserves the best treatment. And wheat is a tough one because it has carbohydrates around the protein inner part of the seed and wheat has so many proteins that people can be allergic to just like milk and so you can tend to have more long-term reactions with wheat we're, we're finding 
And it's important to know that we're looking at each of those and thanks to a wonderful family, they're allowing us to think about how to create a wheat vaccine. This is very different from gluten sensitivities or celiac. We wouldn't wanna necessarily give wheat every day for celiac or for uh, wheat sensitivities because that's a different type of immune reaction. But for wheat allergies, we're really looking forward to thinking about a wheat vaccine that can really help permanently. Interesting time. Let's attempt to wrap up the questions. Thank you, Stacy. Um, what I can do is now that we're on the hour, uh, let me suggest this to this wonderful, very uh, attentive group. I very much appreciate all of your questions. I hope that you will find the book helpful. I always like feedback. We have a, um, a wonderful website for the book and a blog page that our, our great um, colleagues at Digital Natives have been upkeeping and I'm glad that we'll take this conversation and also put it there so that many people can hear it. And so if you have more questions, please post your questions there so that I can go through and try to answer them in real time. I'm so grateful for your interest and I'm very grateful for all of you. And for those of you who have participated in clinical trials or have done OIT, thank you for your courage. And um, really want to also give a shout out to FAIR because you all and we all were talking about being advocates and having voices for our patients and families. And I'm really grateful for FAIR for doing that as well. So um, I hope that this has been helpful to you all and I'm happy to end this now and then we can do more questions via the website. Does that sound okay? I think that's great. Thank you so much for everything. Very informative. I think you can tell my group loved it. So we can't thank you enough. My pleasure. It's really, it's, it's an honor and a privilege and I'm, I'm very grateful. If I can be of more help or if something changes in the science and what I'm saying today all of a sudden becomes wrong in a month, I will let everyone know for sure that we've just got to keep updated and there's a lot of hope and promise of science, but science is a moving target and the better science we have, if, I, if anything changes in the book, I'll let people know right away. We'll chase you down. <laughs> Okay, yeah, do that. Okay. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.